let's continue on our physical exam series in dermatology and start talking today about the secondary lesion. So hopefully at this point you've already watched the last video that talked about the primary lesion. And as a reminder, the primary lesion is the most basic building block of a skin lesion or a rash. Basically, if you wanted to break down your rash or your skin lesion down to the most basic element that gets repeated over and over again to make up that eruption, that would be the primary lesion. As a reminder, the primary lesions that we talked about were the macule, the patch, the papule, the plaque, the nodule, the tumor, the vesicle, the bulla, the pustule, and finally the wheel. If you need a review, remember that that video is always there for you to look at. But today, I wanted to focus instead on the secondary lesion. So the secondary lesion, or sometimes what we call secondary change, is what can happen to the primary lesion. So no matter what, any skin rash or eruption or lesion can usually be described by a primary lesion. But then often that primary lesion will also have a secondary lesion or secondary change. And we're going to run through what those things are today. Just know that the list that I give you is relatively complete. It's most of the stuff that we talk about, but there's always some esoteric ones that can sneak in. Remember that in the last video, what we talked about was that there's a general kind of pattern to how we describe the skin lesion. That can start with the size, the color, an adjective of the primary lesion, and then we talk about the secondary lesion soon thereafter and finally end with distribution. Let's pretend like we have a patient that has gut tape psoriasis. We might say that that person has two to eight millimeter salmon colored papules with micaceous scale and in this case the scale is the secondary lesion that cover the back. And that would be a good example of a description where we're using both the primary lesion which would be the papule as well as the secondary lesion which would be scale. So we're gonna go through that second part, the secondary lesion today. So the first thing I wanna mention is that there is a caveat to the definition of papules and plaques that we talked about last time when we talked about primary lesions. By definition and by convention, we usually say that papules and plaques are raised. However, there is an exception. Often we will refer to any change in the elevation of the skin as a papule or a plaque. So in other words, if you find that there's an area on the skin that's atrophic, meaning it dips down under where the normal skin is, we also call that a plaque. In that case, the primary lesion is the plaque and then the secondary change would be atrophy or sometimes we'll just say it's an atrophic plaque. That change in elevation of the skin is the first type of secondary change that we'll often describe in the exam. A good example of atrophy is discoid lupus, which can be seen here in the left concha bowl. Older lesions tend to scar down and become atrophic over time. The next one that I want to mention, which is probably the most common secondary lesion that we usually talk about, is scale. Now scale implies that there is some epidermal process that's going on. If we see that there's no scale, often we'll say that maybe it's a dermal process if it's raised because there's something that's pushing that skin lesion up. But if there's some raised process and there's scale, then we know that the epidermis might be involved in some way. Often the way the scale is described can actually tell us a lot about the lesion. So for example, greasy scale is how we describe for example, seborrheic dermatitis, but gritty scale is how we describe actinic keratosis scale. Now that said, I think it's probably best if we save all those different descriptors of scale for another video, just because that can be a topic in itself. We will break down the descriptions of scale into all these different buckets because they mean different things diagnostically. The next one that's kind of closely related to scale is crust. And crust is very different from scale because crust implies that there's something draining and then drying up. So usually we'll talk about things like cirrus crust or honey colored crust in the case of impetigo or some type of pus that's drying up. Sometimes we'll talk about things like hemorrhagic crust. So far what we've covered is atrophy, scale, where there's a whole lot of descriptors, and crust, which implies that there's something draining and then drying up on the skin. So the next secondary change I wanna talk about is an erosion. An erosion implies that there's some loss of the superficial layer of the skin, meaning the epidermis. That might be a partial thickness loss or full thickness loss of the epidermis. Importantly, this is not the same thing as atrophy. Atrophy implies that the skin is still intact, it's just lower in elevation than what it normally would be, whereas an erosion means that you're actually losing that top layer of the skin, either in totality or partially. Using these two clinical examples, we can see what the difference truly is between an erosion and atrophy. An erosion on the left, which is seen with toxic epidermal necrolysis, shows complete loss of the epidermis, whereas on the right, the old picture of discoid lupus that was seen earlier in the video is a good example of atrophy, where the epidermis is still entirely intact. It's just a little bit lower in elevation than normal skin. 
Compare that instead to an ulcer. An ulcer implies that there is some loss through the epidermis and starting to get into the dermis. Since we know histologically all the blood vessels are really contained in the dermis, generally ulcers tend to have more bleeding once you've gotten to the dermis than an erosion. And that very quickly leads us to fissures. Fissures are really just linear ulcers. So in other words, it's the loss of the superficial layer of the skin into the dermis, but it's in a linear pattern. Hand eczema is one of the common conditions that causes a lot of painful fissures to occur, often from frequent hand washing. The other thing that we'll often say is excoriation. Now, excoriation is a tricky one because it implies that the patient's been scratching. However, if you're gonna be a purist about the skin exam, you can't really say that there's excoriation unless you've taken a history. So often what I would say is that you should really call those linear erosions, even fissures, and then you can't really call an excoriation until the patient supports the history that they have been scratching at that area to actually cause that to happen. The next one I wanted to mention is a term that we use for constant rubbing of the skin that causes the skin to hypertrophy or get thicker, and then also causes accentuated skin markings on the surface, and that's the word lichenification. So lichenification is the term that we use to describe a chronic eczematous dermatitis. So the perfect example of this is a diagnosis called lichen simplex chronicus. It's a lichenified plaque secondary to the patient scratching, chronically irritating it, and it's just now this itchy, indurated plaque on the skin. And often we see that in chronic eczema or chronic atopic dermatitis. The last couple that I'm going to mention that feel a little bit funny are necrosis and scar. So let's start with necrosis. Necrosis obviously means that there's something dying. The skin is dying in that area, so usually you'll see this eschar, this black or really dark gray, purple looking area. And obviously necrosis is one way to describe it, but really what we're going to start seeing in that area is ulceration because once that skin dies, you obviously the dead skin's gonna fall off in that area. And so necrosis implies that we know what the pathophysiology is on some level, although to be fair, we haven't really figured out why the skin is necrosing yet, and that's something for the dermatologist to figure out. The last one I'm going to mention in terms of secondary lesions is scar. So as a reminder, your skin only scars if you cut into the dermis or beyond. If you're just getting into the epidermis, the skin's not going to scar. This one's a little bit tricky because the primary lesion is basically a papule or a plaque, but at the same time, we might say that it's a scarred papule or a plaque if we know that the texture of the skin is pretty firm like a scar. So we'll sometimes regard those as secondary lesions and secondary change as well. Some lesions can also have two different types of secondary change. This is another photograph of discoid lupus, which demonstrates that over time, you can actually have a scarred and atrophic plaque with chronic changes of discoid lupus. Also notice that this scar is occurring in something that isn't surgical, but rather is just a long-standing process of inflammatory disease. So as you can see, there's a lot of different terms that we'll use for secondary change and secondary lesions when we're discussing the nuances of the primary lesion. But I hope that you're also getting a sense that it's not quite as clean cut as primary lesions are. Primary lesions, we have a confined list, whereas secondary lesion, there's a little bit more in terms of descriptors that we'll use. But generally, what we're trying to describe is what's happened secondarily to the primary lesion. So that about sums it up for the secondary lesion or secondary change to a primary lesion. Over time, I'm hoping that as you piece these videos together and you hear about the primary lesion, secondary lesion, and then future videos, that the skin exam will start to make more and more sense. As always, if you found this to be helpful, please like the video. And of course, if you want to get more of this content, please consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks so much for joining me today to talk about secondary lesions and secondary change. Certainly hope that we'll see you back here at some point soon. See you later.